Good evening to you all. I'm very sorry that I cannot be present in person this evening. It would have been a great pleasure for me to visit the John Paul II Institute again, where I have spent many happy occasions in the past. I cordially greet Vice President Dr. Carl Anderson, Professor David Schindler, Father Antonio Lopez, and Professor Harper, and send heartfelt greetings to the faculty, guests, and all the participants at this important conference on Digitatis Humanae and the rediscovery of religious liberty. The Edict of Milan of 313 has an epochal significance because it marks the initium libertatis for modern man. This statement by a celebrated specialist in Roman law, the sadly missed Gabriel Lombardi, goes to show how its provisions, which carried the signature of the two men with the title of Augustus, Constantine and Licinius, marked not only the gradual ending of the persecution of the Christian, but above all, albeit within the limits of its time, the dawn of religious freedom. In a certain sense, we can trace as far back as the Edict of Milan, the very first emergency in history of two phenomena that today we call religious freedom and the secular state. These are two crucial elements of a good organization of political society. An interesting confirmation of this may be found in two significant teachings of St. Ambrose. On the one hand, the Archbishop never hesitated to call on Christians to be loyal to civil authority, while at the same time, he taught that civil authority must guarantee freedom to citizens on the personal and social level. In this way, recognition developed develop of the boundaries of the public will, whose security both citizens and authorities together are called to ensure. It cannot, however, be denied that the Edict of Milan was something of a failed beginning. The events that ensued, in fact, opened the way to a long and anguished history. In the relationship between state and church, two reciprocal temptations quickly emerged. For the state, that of using the church as instrumentum regni, and for the church, that of using the state as instrumentum salvationis. The historical and unjustifiable admixture of political power with religion has evilly conditioned the various phases that can be distinguished in the practice of religious freedom. It is sufficient to browse through the main stages in these 17th centuries that divide us from the Edith of Milan to grasp the grave contradiction linked to the practice and conception of religious freedom. To save time, I will skip the historical part, which you can read in the printed version. The situation changed profoundly with the promulgation of the Declaration Digitatis Humanae. What are the basic new elements in the conciliar teaching? The Council, in the light of right reason, in itself autonomous, but which is confirmed and illuminated by divine revelation, did not refer in general terms in this context to moral freedom in respect of the truth or a value, but to juridical freedom in the sphere of the relations 
between persons and in social life. Moreover, it is important to be clear that the law in question is a negative right that adequately establishes the limits of the state and of the civil powers, denying them any direct competence in the area of religious choice. Understood in this way, the right to religious freedom implies immunity from coercion in a twofold sense. Man has the right not to be constrained to act against his conscience, and at the same time, not to be prevented from acting in conformity with it. The affirmation of religious freedom thus creates a safety zone which guarantees the inviolability of a human space. The only limit to exercise of this right is set with reference to the provision that just public order be observed, dignitatis humane too. In this way, the conciliar declaration went beyond the classic doctrine of tolerance to acknowledge that the human person has the right to religious freedom and that this right continues to exist even in those who do not live up to their obligation of seeking the truth and adhering to it, dignitatis humane too. In the words of Nikolaus Lokowitz, formerly rector of the University of Munich and president of the Catholic University of Eichstätt, I quote, the extraordinary quality of the Declaration Dignitatis Humane consists in having transferred the subject of religious freedom from be being a notion about truth to being a notion about the rights of the human person. Error may have, may have no rights, but a person has rights even when he is mistaken. Clearly, it is not a matter of a right before God. It is a right with respect to other persons, to the community, and to the state. In the life of men and societies, just like in the life of the church, the acquisition of a renewed knowledge of truth always constitutes the start of a journey more than an arrival point. This applies to the affirmation of religious freedom as it was set out in the Declaration Dignitatis Humane. To speak of religious freedom today involves facing up to an emergency which is progressively assuming a global character. According to an in-depth study by Grimm and Finke, between 2000 and 2007, there were as many as 123 countries in which some kind of religious persecution was evident. And unfortunately, that number is constantly on the increase. If we rapidly scan a list of different countries in the world, we must immediately note the radical difference between real and violent persecution on a religious basis of all those who profess a different faith from the official one, from harassment, which take on more subtle forms. It is known that many violations of religious freedom come about in African and Asian countries, particularly in countries with a Muslim majority. In countries where a state religion still dominates, where the value of a confessional, non-confessional state has not yet been discovered, to promote religious freedom means, first of all, to encourage religious pluralism and openness to all religious expression, 
starting from the repeal of laws which impose criminal punishment for blasphemy. On the other hand, in countries still governed by atheist dictatorships, persecution of dissidents and members of religious community continues to be common practice. Coming now to Western Europe, it seems urgent to overcome latent diffidence of the religious phenomenon, which is inherent in the inadequacy of some conception of secularity, laicite, which end up by engendering an unfavorable atmosphere to authentic religious liberty. According to the Observatory on Intolerance and Discrimination Against Christians in Europe, a certain atmosphere allows cases of intolerance and discrimination against Christians in Europe. It must also be acknowledged that several frequent legal acts and decisions have been taken in the West which tend to coerce the full expression of religious freedom, from prohibition of conscientious objection in a professional sphere, to the ban of wearing and showing religious symbols, to the obligatory teaching, even in religion schools, of subjects based on anthropology, which is opposed to one's own creed. As is known to all, an emblematic case of the conflict between religious liberty and the orientation of public institutions has been in the headlines of the press in America. I'm referring to the HHS mandate and the public debate it has set off, which you all know well. These data, an expression of a serious civilization malaise, demand that we focus more closely on this subject without neglecting the debates, sometimes very lively and certainly never dormant, on the nature and correct interpretation of the Declaration de Gitatis Humane and on the need for it to be adopted. Our reflection will now focus on certain aspects of this theme that are proper to the constitutional democracies in the Northwest of our world. A complex knot of classic problems. First of all, the content of the notion of religious freedom, which at the superficial level attracts very wide approval, has in reality always to some degree lacked clarity. It is in fact tangled up with at least three grave difficulties. A, the relationship between objective truth and the individual conscience. B, the way that religious community relate to state power. C, from the Christian theological point of view, the question of the interpretation of the universality of salvation in Christ in contrast to the plurality of religious religions and world vision, substantive ethical vision. In addition to these more or less classic problems in the interpretation of religious freedom, there are new ones that are no less crucial. Let me mention three such problems. The first is that of the relation between the personal religious quest and its community expression. Often, the question is raised as to whether religious freedom can be limited to merely individual expression. But at the, on the other hand, there is also the question as to the condition under which a religious group can lay claim to public recognition in a plural, multi-religious and multicultural cultural society. Here, 
we are confronted with the delicate question concerning the power of a legitimately constituted public authority to make a distinction between an authentic religion and an inauthentic one. This confirms that the distinction between political power and religion world views is not as obvious as it may appear at first sight. There is a problem of a similar type with the distinction between religions and sects. This is a question as old as the Roman notion of religio licita, but it has recently become much more acute for a variety of reasons. A general trend toward fragmentation, the proliferation of communities within the Christian world, and the agnostic position taken up by most legislators with respect to phenomena with religious connotation, while simultaneously maintaining a positive disposition or favor towards religious communities. Finally, it is important to note that one of the most burning questions today in the area of debate about religious freedom is that of its connection with freedom of conversion. For all these reasons, reflecting on religious freedom and making a practice of it seems to be much more difficult nowadays than we may have expected, especially since the Council Declaration. Thorny issues to be resolved. In this context, if you are to resolve certain thorny issues, at least two types of consideration are useful and important. If you take as our starting point, religious freedom understood as an absence of external restriction in the area of worship and beliefs, the principle laid down in Digitatis Humana still look relevant and indeed complete in terms of their kind. Among the already existing problems, the intervening decades have now thrown up two serious new ones. The first concerns the nexus between religious freedom and peace in society. Various recent studies, as well as actual practice, have demonstrated that very close correlation exists between these two realities. If, in the abstract, we might be able to imagine a type of legislation capable of bringing down the level of diversity between religions, thereby virtually eliminating the conflictedness that may derive from it. On the ground, however, the exact opposite proves to be the case. The more the state imposes limitation, the more religion-based conflict increase. This result is, in fact, perfectly comprehensible. Imposing religion practices or banning them by laws in the evident absence of any possibility of modifying the corresponding personal belief as well only increases resentment and frustration, which then manifests itself in the shape of conflicts in the public arena. The second problem is even more complex and calls for deeper reflection. It has to do with the connection between religious freedom and the attitude of the state and, at various levels, of all the public institutions with respect to religious communities present in civil society. The evolution of liberal democratic states continues to modify the equilibrium that has traditionally been the basis of public power. Even up to a few decades ago, substantial and explicit reference would be made to anthropological structures generally recognized, at least in a broad sense, as constitutive dimensions of religious experience, birth, marriage, procreation, education, death. What has happened now that this reference, identifiable as having a religious origin, has been called into question 
and held to be inapplicable contemporary neoliberalism has moved toward position that try to found what it is political on procedures that are totally neutral with regard to any substantive vision wanting to guarantee an active neutrality. In some cases, however, this even goes so far as to theorize that people who believe in a truth must be marginalized from liberal political debate. This is confirmed by the fact that the classic problem of moral judgment on laws has increasingly become transformed into a problem of religious freedom. This fact makes it necessary and urgent for us to rethink religious freedom and go beyond the theoretical framework peculiar to liberalism, which has, in actual fact, crystallized into an anthropological vision marked by a profound individualism. This vision is, moreover, bolstered by the prevalence of a scientific and technocratic political culture. A theoretical presupposition. The theoretical presupposition of this evolution goes no further in practice than the rigid French model of laïcité, which is based on the idea of the indifference, defined as neutrality, of the institution of the state with respect to the religious phenomenon. At first sight, therefore, it seems suitable for the creation of a sphere favorable to the religious freedom of all. Quite beyond any reference to the specific French model, it is now a widespread conception in European juridical and political culture, particularly within the European institution. This conception interprets the categories of religious freedom in the light of the so-called neutrality of the states and tends to become an institutional negative prejudice toward the religious phenomenon instead of protecting an irreducible distinction between state and religions. Why? Above all, the very idea of neutrality has proved to be quite problematic, particularly because it is not applicable to civil society whose precedence the state must always respect since it is delegated to govern it but not manage it. Today, respecting civil society implies recognizing a new objective fact. Nowadays, in Western civil societies, above all in European ones, the deepest divisions are those between a secularist culture and the religious phenomenon, and not, as is often erroneously believed, between believers from the various faiths. It is imperative to not ignore this datum, even though this does not mean we must underestimate the tragic weight of fundamentalisms and the beneficial contribution of polyarchies. Otherwise, if the proper and necessary non-confessionality of the state, proper and necessary non-confessionality, depends of the idea of neutrality, it may end up legitimizing a vision of public power as the defender of a secularity, laicity, that is extraneous to a mistrust or even discriminates against any religious group or institution. In other words, the conception of the state in a neutralistic sense encourages the idea of identifying in a way that is more practical and theoretical what is secular with what is non-religious. 
In this way, the public arena is willing to accommodate all different vision and practice other than the religious ones. On the strength of this unacknowledged Latin cultural prejudice, while all other positions are considered to be a legitimate bar of contemporary variegated pluralism, religious positions are more likely to be perceived as partisan differences. Consequently, the so-called so neutral state is not, in fact, impartial in cultural terms. Rather, it takes on a secularist orientation which, by means of legislative choices, especially in matters of a sensitive anthropological nature, become hostile towards cultural identities of religious origin. By means of the objectivity and the authority of the law, a culture spreads which is marked by a secularized vision of man, of the world, which is a legitimate voice in a plural society, but which the state cannot assume as its own without implicit taking up a position which improperly limits religious freedom. How are, are we to find a remedy for this serious state of affairs? By rethinking the theme of the non-confessionality of the state within the framework of a renewed idea of religious freedom. What we need is a state which, without appropriating any specific vision, does not interpret its own non-confessionality as detachment, as an impossible neutralization of the world vision that finds expression in civil society. But a state opens up spaces within which each personal and social subject can bring its own contribution to the construction of the common good. The following question arises, however. Is calling for liberty of religion for the various communities and asking for respect for the peculiarities of their minority moral sensibility the best way to deal with this delicate situation? This action, in my view, is absolutely necessary. It is, however, very important to note that if this legitimate claim is not part of a broader agenda involving a clear and coherent hierarchy of elements, there is the risk of reinforcing the idea in the public arena that the actual content of religious identity is made up of nothing more than long, obsolete mythologies and folk legends. These far too brief pointer, pointers not only demonstrate how complex the issue of religious freedom remains, but above all, they encourage us to acknowledge how, today more than ever, this issue represent the most sensitive litmus test for the level of civilization in our plural societies. Today, religious freedom looks as though it is bellwether of the much more wide-ranging challenges connected with the development and practice on the local and universal level of new anthropological, social, and cosmological foundation for a life lived together in the civil societies of this third millennium. In this sense, if religious freedom, 
which is the emblematic expression of freedom of conscience, and therefore also concern non-believers, does not become actual freedom, accorded first place in the hierarchy of fundamental rights, the whole hierarchy crumbles. Obviously, this process cannot, I underline, cannot signify a return to the past. But it has to take place in a context of respect for the plural nature of today's society. Therefore, as I have had occasion to say elsewhere, it must take as its starting point the practical common good involved in our being together. Appealing then to the principle of communication, rightly understood, personal and social subjects who inhabit civil society must both present their own cases and allow others to present theirs with a view to an ordered reciprocal recognition aiming at the good of all. In this connection, I want to refer briefly to a condition I consider to be absolutely essential for those setting out on this arduous path, a condition whose fulfillment cannot be postponed. Taking note of the teaching of Dignitatis Humanae in connection with the dawn of religious freedom inaugurated by the Edict of 313, according to which adherence to truth is possible only in a voluntary and personal way, and external coercion is contrary to its nature, it has to be acknowledged that the realization of this double condition hinges on a presupposed personal commitment to truth. Indeed, to follow the duty and even the right to seek the truth, dignitatis humanae, three, releases religious freedom from the suspicion of being just another name for religious indifferentism, which in turn presents a precise world vision, at least practically speaking. In the present historical moment, the world vision of religious indifferentism tends to dominate the others. The first concern today seems in fact to have become that of wondering whether there is, generally speaking, any meaning in living with a view to an ultimate end, or whether human existence is not rather an aggregate of systems with a partial meaning that are not comparable with each other. According to this vision, the very idea of the search for a truth that is ultimate and therefore religious is simply losing any meaning. This is in spite of the fact that an age-old experience common to every man in every era and place attests that the search for a meaning and a route through life, that is, for life to make sense, is so ingrained that it is transmitted from generation to generation. And it is in spite of the fact that this ingrained search is at the heart of human experience, and it blossoms in the encounter of the eye with reality. Not because truth is something determined from time to time by circumstances, but because truth, transcendent and absolute, and infinitely more than a mere ensemble of notion is rather a living and personal reality that calls on our universal experience of this proportion of existence to its meaning and therefore in sizzling calls human freedom into play, asking us to make a decision. How are we to react then to the objection of those who do not perceive the obligation to seek the truth 
in order to adhere to it. Our free invitation to them to reflect on what it means to have the obligation and the right to search for the truth is crucial. Augustine, a genius at giving expression to human anxiety, had grasped the secret of it, as Benedict XVI observes, I quote, it is, in, it is not we who possess the truth after he having sought it, but the truth that seeks us out and possesses us. In this sense, it is truth itself, through the significance of the relation and circumstances of life in which each person is a protagonist, which presents itself as the serious event in human existence and the shared life of human being. The truth which seeks us out is evidenced in the irrepressible longing which makes man aspire to it. Quid enim fortiot desiderat anima quam veritate? What does the soul desire more strongly than the truth? Augustine, this longing respects the freedom of all, even of the person who call himself agnostic, indifferent, or atheist. Religious freedom would otherwise be an empty word. The claim for religious freedom would become absolutely empty if we did not suppose the existence of human beings who personally and intimately cannot renounce to desire to adhere to an ultimate truth that determines their life. If it is true that it is a duty of the state to guarantee space for public expression of religion and communication between subjects, it is also true that the quality of its contents will depend on the vitality of those who inhabit that space. In this sense, the civic and political commitment of Christians is particularly urgent, as Benedict XVI repeatedly reminded us. What is at stake is not only the chance for Christians and more generally for believers to express themselves publicly, but to do so knowing and being able to provide the reasons for their experience, which shifts the way from the right of believers to their duty to witness. We are aware that there is a serious risk today of this option not being adequately guaranteed by law, and that is therefore carries with it a high personal price to pay. This places Christian within the logic of witness, which, as Benedict XVI reminded us, at the recent Synod of Mission on new evangelization for the Christian faith, Confession is always a confession who carries, therefore, within a martyrological element. The Pope notes that, I quote, witness is not only something of the heart and mouth, but also of the intelligence. It must be thought and thus Thought and intelligently conceived, it touches the other person. It's a task that requires effort, but which is fascinating. Thank you.